Well, I, I, I find it in, in terms of, sorry, Uta, you were going to. I was just going to add that by sharing our experiences, we make us more similar to each other, which again, facilitates communication. So it's a kind of uh, ratchet yeah. thing that culture does to us in a sense that we are um, not just uh, bombarded with different ideas, but we, uh, we create them actually. And we make sure, I think by sharing them, that they're not too different. Of course, you do get dangerous situations sometimes with certain groups appearing, um, like sects, for example, where um, they're quite closed off from the rest of society. And certain ideas can flourish and they seem to kind of infect off. each other with these ideas again becoming more similar so just talking to sharing these ideas but it can be very dangerous and they can become completely divorced <clears throat> from, from, reality, from reality whereas of course we are very closely in touch with that yeah. <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> you talk about, I mean, what one of the one of those dangerous areas to talk about in any book where you, you talk about laughter and, oh, yes. and what that can tell. And, and, and I mean, I find that fascinating because I think, you know, working in that area, that is when people sometimes will allow their inner thoughts. You know, the, the comedian is dealing often with the inner world. And for that short, but but I, I was fascinated in you know you you start exploring laughter and there's a certain point where you go we'll do it a little bit more later on. But this this is one of those areas which I, I what are the problems in 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 understanding the mind and laughter, Uta? Well, um, I think it is it is an, an amazingly interesting um, um, area to study, and of course Sophie Scott is the um, leading person in this field, and she has I think. Um, brought evidence together to say that laughter is the social glue that binds us together. So we are actually laughing much more when we are together with other people and thereby presumably revealing much more, but it's also the contagion effect, which is very interesting. Again, part of this uh, sharing or having, you know, uh, uh, making manifest I suppose that we have similar experiences that's what laughter does and especially contagious laughter but there is much more to it I think there is there is the laughter that is um, just the speaker not the listener um, it happens in in conversations you think they're both laughing in fact it's the person who speaks who very often sort of pauses after a statement and laughs almost to sort of have a comment without words, like saying, I, I might not mean it. I not, didn't mean to be aggressive. <laughs> yes, so, yeah, something like that. <laughs> or, you know, I'll, I'll modify that in a minute or, you know, let me Don't know. Don't take me seriously. Yeah, what, what, what you think about it. So it has a very strongly regulating function in communication because it's always a danger, isn't it? When you talk to other people that they might misunderstand you. They might think you are. Um, being um, aggressive or um... but it relates to this problem of why irony doesn't work on email <laughs> you can't laugh on Twitter yeah. either it's very well, difficult again that seems to show you know social media has shown those limitations you said of just how much so yeah. many uh you know actually the, the, the clues within the delivery of even the most simple sentence and within the face and all of those yeah. things that once you remove that the the possibilities of interpretation um become many and sometimes terrifying yeah i'm very interested i mean we're having a zoom session at this very minute and we've had lots of them during lockdown and I'm very interested in the idea that it's, we need to see ourselves as well as the person we're talking to. And I like to have a, the biggest possible picture of me rather than a little one in the corner. So I can make sure that I'm, first of all, my gestures are in the right place. And secondly, that I am actually responding. <laughs> but to what's it's going not on. the case that we see ourselves in normal face to face interaction. We don't, we don't do that at all. That's a very big difference. Yeah. We don't we don't miss it then, but I think we get a lot of reflection from mm. the other person in face to face interaction. And again, it's almost a form of of uh, contagion so that you have a lot of mimicry 
uh, mm. in, in gestures and, and facial interaction, but it's very subtle, of course, because if you do notice that you're being imitated, you get very, very cross. It's very, very um, offensive if you say, you know, it's, it's mocking if somebody, um, you know, yeah. But there's also, I mean, in conversations, I mean, there's a lot of work on this, there's all sorts of alignment. So you align the rate at which you're speaking, you align in terms of the, the words you're likely to use, uh, the way you do your grammar. And there's even one experiment that says that communication is better if you imitate the foreign accent of the person you're speaking to. Ooh. But as Uta says, they probably shouldn't notice that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Only if You're right notice. about that, that the, the, the getting it just right, because all that neurolinguistic programming, and I've met people who've gone through all that, and unfortunately yeah. I can normally see, you know, that bit with what, once you've learned how people do the trick, it's a yeah. very alienating thing. Yeah, yeah. And you want to shout to everyone, can't you see the trick? It's a trick. But yeah. that's the, the copying. I mean, you talk a lot about the importance of, of our, our, our learning through mimicry through copying yeah. as well in the book don't you and, and i'm interested in knowing some of the again the, the early understanding of you know at, at, at what stage we can start to measure how learning from copying begins wow um well i mean in evolution we know it happens even in fruit flies but in um in, in development it's still, it's, it's, it is very early, but it is, it is an area that's sort of a bit controversial. I mean, there are people who are very keen on saying that, you know, there has to be basic learning, of course, uh, but, you know, for language, we only, we only learn the language that, that we are born into. Um, but it certainly seems to be, there seems to be a lot of um, kind of copying of sounds that's going on that's very, very important for that, even before you know you you have a language proper so that the mechanisms must be there and of course we do have um, um, models that might be used by artificial agents um, oh yes i mean there are more and more experiments now showing that artificial agents will learn best from copying other artificial yeah, agents yeah. rather than learning from scratch yeah you think yeah. that learning firsthand might in the end be best but not so not at all because you know you 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 often haven't got the time to invest in this uh first hand uh learning and you make mistakes which if you learn from others they've already made the mistakes yes. so, so we we, have, yeah. we 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 think one of the basic things actually we try and say in the book in that that you know makes us social is learning through others, learning from others. And one of the means of learning from others is copying. Mm. I, I wanted to ask, because we've got, I, I've suddenly realized how li little time we've got. I mean, we have got to question three though. So we've got to- two Oh, more really? <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna leap through lots of different things. And and uh, and one of them is, uh, Chris, you talk a lot about, uh, Oh, not a lot, but but it, you, you you touch on uh, PET scanners and and in in the nineteen uh, nineties when they so can you tell us a little bit about how the ability to actually observe the brain and the technology how that's changed? First, we'll just start with basically what a PET scan is. Well, yes, this is about functional imaging, and a PET scanner is um, basically well. First of all, you have to inject the person, usually me with radioactive ox water, with water with radioactive oxygen in it. And this obviously goes into the blood and it sends out positrons, which are detected by the Ritz White's positron is the P, what the P is for. And the positrons go out in a beautiful way. So you can actually detect where the origin is, which is obviously in the blood. And the faster the blood is flowing, the more of these events happen so you can see where exactly in the brain, in the depth of the brain, the blood is flowing most. And the blood flow is a very good indicator of where the nervous system is active. So when the nerves become active, they need more energy, so the blood flow increases. So that's basically how it works. Now, MRI is much better than PET for the simple reason that you don't have to inject people with radioactivity. In fact, you don't have to inject them with anything. But you can, and there's a slightly more indirect way of measuring blood flow using MRI. But again, you're seeing, you're 
indirectly detecting where the brain is active. And that so meant that for the first time you could actually put a normal, healthy human being into a scanner, make them do some ridiculous task and find out precisely which bit of the brain became active when they were doing this task. The biggest effect, I, the thing that I most noticed was actually not so much the functional scanning, but the structural scanning. So an MRI machine gives you a beautiful photograph of the brain um, in, you know, in depth, in 3D, you can slice it all sorts of ways, and you can see precisely what's, what it looks like. So in the olden days, there were neuropsychologists in every neurology department, and if a patient came in with a head injury or a stroke, they would be sent to the neuropsychologist asking the question, where is the lesion? And you would do tests, you would have, front, you know, tests that were sensitive to frontal lobe damage, to temporal lobe damage, to parietal lobe damage, and you would write back and say, I think the lesion is in the left parietal lobe or something like that. And then more or less overnight, F MRI came in and you could just put the patient in the scanner and you could see precisely where the lesion was. That was a huge impact on, on the way neurology worked. And of course, it meant that you could now have, you still had the point for the neuropsychologist because they you still had to work out what was the effect of this lesion on behavior and on experience and you now had a much stronger link between the location of the lesion and the change in behavior and experience that it seemed to have caused so those were very big changes but the functional as I say was the first time you could actually do this in humans all the work previously was done in animals or by looking at humans with lesions and now you can actually look at the normal brain as it was functioning. And what are the disadvantages in terms of, I know in the book, for instance, you mentioned that we have to be aware of the fact that someone is aware they are in an fMRI. So, so uh, immediately you are in a different mental state than you yes. would be if you were doing these tasks outside it. So I wonder if we could just run through some of, some of the, the, the problems that we've begun to, to kind of... Yes, I mean, there are sort of funny technical problems like your brain is actually a slightly different shape when you're lying down from when you're standing up, which you have to. <laughs> um, I think the problem of people being anxious in scanners, in a sense, you can get over by scanning them a lot, <laughs> which you can now do with MRI, which you couldn't do with PET. Um, and indeed, one of the experiments I was involved with, they actually managed to get people to fall asleep in an MRI scanner, which is quite an achievement because it's something like 100 decibel noise when you're in there. So I think that sort of problem can be overcome. The more difficult problem, which is actually true for almost any psychology experiment, is what is this, what is the person actually doing? Are they doing what you told them to do? Have they understood what you intended them to do? And are they thinking about other things at the same time or instead of what they're supposed to be thinking about? So, I mean, these are problems which are certainly heightened when you put people in scanners. So, I mean, I mean, they're probably thinking, why on earth have I volunteered for this boring experience or something like that? Yeah. Oh, I'm not. I'm always available, by the way. Good, good. <laughs> Absolutely. I've only done it twice. I, no. I love going. <laughs> And have an fMRI. I think it's one of the most ex exciting things. Yeah. The only thing I can't do is I can't do a, a rest state. Is what I found out. Uh, I tried yes, to, you. and they said it. It seemed quite busy, and because I got yeah. resting, <laughs> long Good Friday in my head, I was just running that instead. Because it. Got yeah. I, I mean, what is the technology? What in in, in imagining what we need next? Because I know a few people have said well, the problem with the fMRI is it is it's still dealing on a very big scale in terms of looking at the really re refined elements of what is going on. For instance, in a social interaction, yeah. um, you can't really see. Is it fair to say that an fMRI you can't really see that kind of? Uh... Well, they're trying. I mean, you can have the so-called hyperscanning. You can scan two people simultaneously interacting with each other. But it's not very, it's very artificial, um, I think. And there's a new technique called NIRS, near infrared spectroscopy, where, which measures roughly the same thing, but not quite so accurately. But this is something you can wear on your head and you can walk about with it and you can interact with people in a slightly more um, 
naturalistic, naturalistic setting. Yes. But I think the problem is not, is in a way, the advantage of MRI is it's so crude. If you could measure what every neuron in the brain was doing simultaneously, I can't remember how many neurons are there, nine billion or something. Um, it would be, you, <laughs> you'd be in trouble. Yes. And so you have to have some simplification of what you measure. And the, the other thing, I think the big problem is we don't really have a theory of how the brain works which would enable us yeah. to somehow simplify what's going on that that's the so it's not so much the technology i think it's the theory that is lacking at the moment but the field of neuroscience is absolutely vast so you get the people who just look at single neurons and that's there's a world in there you know what's going on and the people who look at single synapses yeah. and yes there's, there's synapses that connect different neurons and you can just see what happens in the when a synapse sort of opens and uh, exchanges the uh, neurotransmitters or whatever and uh, you get um, an enormous amount of knowledge from looking at these single cells usually of course in animals or sometimes in in organoids you know yeah. artificially produced sort of nervous cells but what does this tell us about psychology about the mind there is such too big a gap because we don't know yet how a unit like a like a single neuron, um, how that work relates to you know a thought, or um, walking in a particular direction rather than another. So I think it is incredibly hard to know at what level uh, neuroscience can be to connect from this very very detailed work to the kind of things that we are talking about like um you know thinking about thoughts which is just... but there is i mean the other end of neuroscience is so-called systems neuroscience where you treat it as a system and that becomes interestingly linked up with artificial intelligence and neural networks and all that sort of thing where there's an interesting parallel and constant swapping of information between the people who are doing the artificial neural networks and deep learning and the people who are doing the systems neuroscience and they influence each other constantly in most interesting ways well that's, I, that's, that's nice I think that's, the, that's what we what we idea. like it's the idea that we shouldn't stop with an individual brain and saying oh marvelous we just look at this brain we should look at how this brain is influenced by uh, other brains. Now you're getting models. even worse. I was thinking oh. of them. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we That's are. That's the other problem, yeah. We are sort of on about how, how uh, uh, it's not enough to, yes, to just brain is not look enough. at yeah. one individual brain. Yeah. Hence, hence our interest in the social side of things. Hence, you know, um, it's all about social yeah. neuroscience. We, we try and emphasize that. But also, and I know to the last time that we talked, we, we were talking about neural pruning and 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 yeah. about the fact yeah. that the, the the great discoveries is it, it see and, and I'm talking in a very base way, but but it's it used to seem to be you get to a certain age, you reach proper adulthood. What's that in 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 terms of brain development? Twenty three, twenty four. You know, yeah. it's not eighteen, is it? It's a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then that's it. It's over. <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and, and I know you said one of the most optimistic things that you've discovered is actually that's not true at all, is it? Well, um, clearly, um, it, the, the, there is an incredible amount of, pro, of, of, of proliferation of cells in the very, in the fetus, in the very young baby, in the young child and so on. Far too many cells. And they have to be pruned back, or connections rather, not yeah, cells. Too many connections. Sorry, I should think about this, uh, this differently. And it's the pruning back that really uh, has to do with um, learning certain very important things like language, for example. And there seems to be a kind of sensitive period, um, which probably lasts a few years it's not not a tiny window usually and then there may be another sensitive period during adolescence where again a lot of shaping and pruning of connections happens in the brain we don't really know what happens later i think that's a real big problem 
um, it's it's clear that we uh, we are getting a bit more set in our ways and ideas, but not entirely. I mean, we have um, all sorts of evidence for continued plasticity by learning, and in particular, we know that um, we 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 don't just learn and then end up with something that we own and have but it's use it or lose it that's really we have to constantly practice what is important now many things that we may have learned early in life will not be so useful later on and we won't be so good at them anymore there's no doubt but then there are other things uh, that we need that might be completely new requirements and we can learn them and we know that many old people learn how to use uh, uh, mobile right. phones or <laughs> how to do Zoom when before they would have said, absolutely impossible, I can't be done with that. But it's, it's, um, it's a sign um, that, that we are, um, I think, all the time adapting. And that, and and that means new connections. It does, yeah. 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 I'm just